We're glad to have you along for Agriculture Today. Our guest now was the lead author on a very detailed look at the use of the Ogallala Aquifer, that vast aquifer in western Kansas and parts of adjacent states that is so heavily, heavily relied upon by agricultural interests and others in those regions. As we know, the aquifer has been drawing down significantly in recent decades. This study got at that and tried to codify that, but also projected ahead to the future use of the aquifer and what might be done to extend its life. Joining us now is a professor of civil engineering here at Kansas State, Dave Stewart, who along with others here at the university and elsewhere, contributed to this quite extensive effort in and to itself. And Dave, thank you for coming over and sharing a few thoughts about what you've discovered here. Describe in your words the cause behind this rather elaborate effort, if you would. Sure. Um, I, I think that the the general uh, the general public has been aware that the groundwater is going down in the Ogallala, um, that we're using a little bit more water than is being naturally recharged, and that at some point in the future we're going to have to uh, reduce pumping rates. And uh, the kind of questions that, that I hear when I go out and talk to people are, you know, how long will the Ogallala last? How long can we continue to pump it? Um, what is the recharge rate? How long will it take to refill the aquifer if we pump it dry? Dave, you mentioned the uh, mass of data that you were working with here. Mm -hmm. you, you might describe that in lay terms anyway. Sure, sure. Uh, in Kansas, uh, every a uh, well that's, that's used for irrigation or municipal use, uh, anything that irrigates more than two acres uh, is cons has to have a water right. And uh, the approval for that has to go through the chief engineer for the Division of Water Resources and the Department of Agriculture. And so if you look at the water right numbers, we're up to about number 66,000. So there's a lot of water rights. Every one of those files a water use report every year. Uh, most of those are meters, at least in western Kansas, and so people read off the meters. So it's very accurate water data that we have in terms of water use. Um, in order to project the declines in groundwater, we had to look at an observation well network. Uh, there were about 3,000 observation wells, wells that are being measured by the Kansas Geological Survey, by the Division of Water Resources, and by the groundwater management districts. And that information gets measured periodically throughout the year for all those wells. And so that information had to be pared down to figure out the change in groundwater elevation over time. And what you found over time, over those several decades, was that the usage accelerated considerably from, say, the 60s in that ballpark to 2010 or so. Yeah, that, that's right. So, so by looking at the well functions, we, we knew the elevation in each well. Um, we could take the change in elevation between five-year increments uh, for each well and then Krieg that using this geospatial technique to be able to interpolate it across the entire aquifer. And if you look at the difference in volume between two five-year periods, that tells you how much of the aquifer is dewatered. And so that gave us the change in storage. And as you projected forward, uh, the rough conclusion you came to that uh, in 50 years' time, as much as 69% of the aquifer would have been depleted since that era when irrigation really started to take effect? What happens is that as, as you pump the well, the groundwater goes down and the ability to extract the water decreases. Um, the well yields become lower. We're pulling out less water now in the wells that we used to mm -hmm. regionally when you look at all the wells. It's not an individual well basis, but it's overall for the entire region. So in, in roughly another 15 years, we're going to begin to see regional declines in the groundwater extraction rates. Bringing in the interdisciplinary aspect really really helps. Uh, when you look at the water use efficiencies in corn, that has increased uh, linearly uh, by about 2% per year. We're, we're producing 2% more corn per every unit of water every year. There, there's reasons for that. Uh, if you look at the literature, we have changes in irrigation technology. We have changes in uh, genetics and crop genetics, and we have changes in water use management strategies. So they've all contributed to growing more crop with the same amount of water. And as a consequence, even though the groundwater extraction rates are expected to peak around 2025, we see those water use efficiencies kicking in, enabling us to have 
increased crop through about 2040, between 2040 and 2050. Analysis also suggests that this can be mitigated to some extent by good, efficient uses of water, and that it, the aquifer can be, in fact, extended. You might spend a few moments on that aspect. Yeah, what we did is we, we looked at what would happen if, if uh, proactively there were reductions in the water today, and what that would do to agricultural production today, and what it would do to agricultural production in the future. Uh, currently, recharge is supplying about 15% of the pumping rates that's going into the wells. And so we looked at reducing water use by 20% today. What the study shows is that if, if you reduce the current groundwater extraction by 20% today, uh, the agriculture production will decrease to values we saw about 15 years ago. So we would produce about the same amount of irrigated corn and be able to feed about the same number of cattle that we did 15 years ago. But the benefit of doing that is that by, by saving that water now, we'll have it in the future. And instead of having peak crop production, peak corn production, ar around 2040 to 2050, that would shift to about 2070. And the prospects beyond 2070 are much brighter. There's, there's a lot more corn being produced after 2070. We're able to save enough water to be able to enable the crop breeders and the people developing the technology to apply the water, the ability to figure out ways to do it smarter and smarter and smarter, just like we've done in the past. If we can keep getting better and better, the, the drop-off is not going to be as, as, as fast with some reductions today. Well, it's as realistic a portrayal of what is happening with the Ogallala as you could possibly find. And it's taken in so many parameters and uh, worked them all together through this uh, very useful model to come up with some projections on the future life of the aquifer and how that might be extended, bearing great results of high importance to Kansas agriculture and beyond. Thanks, Dave, for coming over, sparing a few moments and sharing the story here as it's been uh, uncovered through your research and that of your colleagues. Appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you, Eric. I've enjoyed talking to you. He is a professor of civil engineering here at Kansas State University, Dave Stewart, and he led a team of researchers here at Kansas State looking at the uh, past, present, and future use of the Ogallala Aquifer and what uh, may be possible in the way of extending that valued and precious water resource for Kansas agricultural use well into the future. We'll have more on agriculture today after these moments aside on the K-State Radio Network. <music> 